So today we're going to talk about the other two aspects of what sugars are really useful for in the food industry, which is color as well as texture. So today what we're going to specifically focus on is two different reactions. We're going to really talk about the Maillard reaction in a little bit more depth than we have previously and then we're going to talk about the effects on texture. So when we talk again about the Maillard reaction it's important to recognize the difference between reducing and non-reducing sugars and that has to do with whether or not a hemiacetyl group is present or not. A hemiacetyl group again is the presence of an oxygen within the ring then a carbon and then an oxygen. So we go oxygen, carbon, oxygen. This group here is a hemiacetyl group. Therefore, lactose is a reducing sugar. It must maintain that hemiacetyl group to actually be able to undergo reversible cyclization. So be, being able to go back and forth between the linear form and the cyclic form. So as you can see in the case of sucrose, we've got our oxygen, we've got our carbon, but then off of this carbon here, we have no additional oxygen. We have to go down to another carbon before that happens. So that sugar, sucrose, is a non-reducing sugar. So non-reducing sugars do not go through Maillard reaction. So what we're going to do today is here, we have a pot of boiling water. So we're just about at 100 degrees Celsius and it's pure water. So once it gets to 100 degrees Celsius, we'll go ahead and add sugar and the addition of that sugar is going to elevate the boiling point, right? But we'll get to that in a minute. So when we talk about Maillard reaction, again, it's important to be able to recognize which sugars will be able to participate in that reaction. And again, that ability to undergo linearized from the cyclic form to the linear form is through the presence of that hemiacetyl group. So that's really what you have to be able to recognize to be able to identify whether or not a sugar is a reducing sugar or not. Now, when that undergoes cyclization, that first carbon that has the, the oxidized group will go from being an achiral carbon, meaning not chiral, to a chiral carbon. This is what we call the anomeric carbon and that cyclization allows for the formation of another chiral carbon. So within the ring structure, this carbon, which was achiral before, is now chiral. And depending on the configuration, if that hydroxyl group is above or below plane, changes if it's an alpha or beta anomer. This doesn't really matter when we talk about disaccharides, but once we start talking about polysaccharides and oleosaccharides, this becomes very important because it determines how the morphology of that fiber is formed. So again, reducing sugars are able to go back and forth between the cyclic and acyclic form. These are glucose, galactose, lactose, maltose are all reducing sugars. These undergo both browning reactions, both Maillard reaction and caramelization. Non-reducing sugars, again, they don't have the presence of that hemiacetyl group. They are unable to partake in the Maillard reaction. They can still undergo browning reactions through caramelization. So this is the Maillard reaction. In third year chemistry, you're going to talk about this in a lot more detail. But for the purpose of today, we're going to look at a few features of the Maillard reaction to show some of the major changes. So the first thing that happens is, again, that glucose must undergo the transformation from the cyclic to the linear group. Again, this is because we need that carbonyl group to interact with an amine group on a protein or on an amino acid. So first thing we get is a condensation reaction where we lose water and we form our protein sugar compounds, which we call a shift base. Now, that formation of a shift base, again, relies on the fact that that sugar is a reducing sugar, meaning it's got a carbonyl present. It then undergoes a series of rearrangements. So what's basically happening is this carbonyl group, which is here, undergoes a series of shifts and it ends up with a double bond moving down 
from the amine group down here between this group and then eventually between that carbonyl group. Why that's important, that shifting in the double bond to a close proximity to a hydroxyl group is unstable. So it's a very reactive group. What this ends up doing then is it basically forms a series of reactions or hydrolysis reactions where that large shift base breaks down into smaller aldehydes, ketones, acids, alcohols. Now why is this important? Those aldehydes, ketones, acids, those are essential in forming aromatic as well as flavor compounds. So this gives you that smell of cooked meat or of toasted bread. Now, depending on the amino acid that's present, so Maillard reaction will undergo the reaction with any amine group, meaning any protein, any amino acid will partake in this chemical reaction. The products that are formed down here are dependent partially on the side chain of that amino acid. So we'll get all different flavor compounds depending on the proteins and amino acids that are present. One of particular importance is asparginine. And the reason why asparginine is so important is when we undergo those degradation products, we find the formation of acrylamide. And acrylamide is an extremely important compound when we talk about the safety of food products. So EPA, World Health Organization, they all have very, very strict guidelines on how much acrylamide can be found in water. Now, having said that, the Maillard reaction is extremely beneficial from an organoleptic sensory standpoint. So again, the cooked flavors, the sensory attributes of these products are highly dependent on these small molecules. The other thing you'll notice, well one molecule we'll point out, is this one down here. Hydroxymethylferferol. Now hydroxymethylferferol is an extremely, extremely important molecule because it undergoes conjugation. What, is con to condensate, con yeah. what does condensation mean? Basically it means that we're going to undergo polymerization. So this very small molecule will undergo reactions with other small molecules that are present and by doing so will undergo that polymerization so we're almost at 100 degrees. We'll undergo that polymerization and that polymerization is what gives rise to that brown color. So does anyone remember from first year physics what leads to color? Why do some molecules appear colored? First year of, yeah. Is it like when the electrons move to a different state? Yes, and what's, what molecular feature is required to do that? Not energy, there's a certain structure in molecules that's required to actually undergo or absorb light. Conjugation, right? The presence of a double bond, a single bond, a double bond, a single bond, a double bond, a single bond. Or an aliphatic ring, something like benzene. So the presence of those in long structures allows for electrons or energy to be transmitted across that molecule, allowing for absorption and sometimes emission of light, so phosphorescence or fluorescence. So right now in this room, what is the boiling point of this water? Approximately. 100 degrees C. What happens to the boiling point when I add sugar? It's going to go up. So right now, We're at a boil, so you can all see it boiling, and we're going to add about equal parts water to equal parts sucrose. Now, is sucrose a reducing sugar? No. So this is not going to undergo Maillard reaction. There's also no protein in here, so it won't undergo Maillard for that reason too. I knew I was going to do that. Do you want to just stir it until it dissolves? Okay. And then once it dissolves, throw the, the um, back in, please. Thanks.
So, again, when we have a reducing sugar in the presence of protein, and if that protein contains a large amount of asparginine, we get the formation of acrylamide. When we think of acrylamide production, this is very, very high when the temperature is elevated. So what foods do we get to very high temperatures when we cook? So when we barbecue something, right? So when we cook it over a flame, what else? Yeah. Baking things. There's one other one that really produces a lot of acrylamide that has the highest temperature. Frying, using frying oils. So in all three of these cases, what do you notice? There's very little water. So it's not like you're boiling it. So boiling a food is not going to undergo Maillard reaction. Why? Why would water prevent or slow down the rate of the Maillard reaction? Yeah. Okay. Partly. That's, yeah, kind of the same thing. Another reason. What is that first step of that reaction? That formation of that shift base relies on condensation. So water is actually a product of that reaction. And if water is a product, and there's a lot of water, we get a feedback inhibition, right? Remember first year chemistry? When you have a reactant that, or a product that's present when you're trying to do a reaction, to drive that reaction further, you try to remove that product from that reaction. Now, how significant is it? When we talk about the formation of acrylamide, there's very little acrylamide when we talk about, let's say, in a pack of chips or in a, in a serving of french fries. The problem is, Maillard reaction happens over so many different food products that when you actually take into account all of the acrylamide you get on a daily basis, you're actually above the USPE and World Health recommendations for a compound for acrylamide to actually causing detrimental health effects. So chronic consumption of foods that have been heated to high temperatures that have the presence of a reducing sugar and asparginine can actually be carcinogenic over a chronic lifetime of consumption. What foods are notorious for containing high levels of, of asparginine? Anyone know? Where do we find asparginine naturally found in produce? Spinach? Oh, cruciferous? No. Think of it, yeah, potatoes. And why is that detrimental? Think about what we do with potatoes. We fry them in potato chip manufacturing, in french fry manufacturing. So when we do that, every time that reaction is taking place, we are producing acrylamide. And you are consuming acrylamide. So this could be one of the reasons why cancer rates are so high is because we constantly and chronically consume acrylamide. But there's things we can do to reduce the amount of Maillard reaction. Does anyone know, remember from the first class what we added which impeded that color formation? Remember the test tubes we did? We had one with glucose that had two glucose and we added something to it? Sulfites. Remember, sulfites inhibit Maillard reaction. But sulfates have a whole other set of problems which leads to consumer acceptance issues. This doesn't necessarily sound like that big of an issue. In the United States and California, have, has anyone ever heard of Proposition 65? Really controversial. Anything that undergoes significant Maillard reaction or anything that was implemented in being a carcinogen had to be labeled. So has anyone been to California lately? Yeah? Did you notice anything weird in Starbucks and McDonald's? No? So all of them have to actually have on display a warning that their product is carcinogenic. So every time you have a glass of coffee, any time you have grilled meat, there is acrylamide present in that product. So it's something to be conscientious about. This is really, really significant when you eat a lot of deep fried 
potato-based products. So they've actually began to legislate how much acrylamide or how you label acrylamide on products. And this becomes even more problematic when you think of the fact that potatoes are a staple food for many different cultures. So whenever you heat, a dry heat, a potato-based product, you are going to form asparginine. But there's all kinds of things we can do to potatoes. And one of them is GMO, so genetically modified potatoes, which reduce the amount of asparginine that's produced. So they're not adding any genes, they're silencing genes. And that silencing of genes reduces the amount of asparginine that's present in the, in the potato, which means that it can prevent the formation of acrylamide when frying. So would you need to buy this potato to have at your house to make mashed potatoes with? Probably not. But if you are doing, if you're a McDonald's and you're undergoing a frying operation, it makes sense that you would use this GMO product because it would actually have beneficial health consequences with that reduced amount of acrylamide. And this brings us to a really kind of sensitive topic with GMOs. Are there any anti-GMO people here? <laughs> so no, which is kind of a good thing. In, these, in this um, low acrylamide french fry, or the low acrylamide potatoes, these are actually about to reach the market in the US, which will be the first GM potato product on the Canadian US market. Now, remember when we talked about Maillard reaction? Again, it relies on that, su that sugar undergoing that reverse cyclization, so in its linear form, and then it undergoes a condensation reaction with the protein. In this case, we don't have the protein present, so what we see is a series of dehydration reactions. So when you're making a caramel, what are we doing? We're letting water boil off, right? As that water is boiling off, what is happening to the concentration of that sugar? It's going up, right? So right now, we're just at about a boiling point of about 100 degrees. So as now the temperature rises, the temperature rise is going to be proportionate to the amount of water lost, right? Because that boiling point is going to be limited by the colligative properties that we talked about, that water binding, based on the sugar we have added. So we've added sucrose. Sucrose has caused those water molecules to bind to it to form hydrogen bonds. It's less available to partake in chemical reactions. Water is evaporating off. As that water is evaporating off, just like it was in the ice cream, except in the ice cream it was freezing out into ice crystals, that phase now of water is becoming greater concentration of sugar. The elevated concentration of sugar increases the boiling point of that sugar of that sugar water solution. So as that happens, as we drive off that water, we are creating a series of dehydration reactions. We're eliminating water from that sugar molecule. So we're changing the structure and pushing out water. And by doing that, we get the formation of, again, that same compound we mentioned that creates the flavor and, and color compounds in Maillard. We get that HMF, so that hydroxy methyl furfural, and as that begins to form, we get polymerization. As we get polymerization, we're going to see this solution, the sugar solution, go from clear to brown, right? Now, while we're doing that, take one of each, um, sorry. Um, one of each. Go right here. Grab one of each. So, caramelization in the food industry, we very rarely use it in itself to make a confectionery product. It becomes very, unless you're talking about a glass candy. So, in these ones, if you look at the back as you're passing it around, You'll notice that there's also a little bit of milk, so you will have some Maillard reaction happening in here. But we also have a balance between the amount of sucrose, or sugar, 
and the amount of glucose that we have present. And that's really important in determining how that structure forms. So not only is it the amount of water that's left in those candies that's going to change that physical property from a soft caramel to a really hard caramel, so very similar in ingredients, just differences in how long we process or how long we actually undergo that caramelization for. In third year food chemistry, you will learn what all the different sugars are used for in the confectionery industry and why some are what we call doctoring agents or softening agents and other ones produce very hard or crystalline materials. So we can modify that. So when we have caramelization, we have the production of HMF. HMF is that characteristic flavor that you taste when you eat a caramel. When that HMF undergoes condensation reactions, we get two different polymers, and those polymers differ simply based on their chain length. So we get carmelin and carmeline. The first one is a smaller molecule. Smaller molecules don't impart as much viscosity, right? So the shorter the molecular, the shorter the molecule, the less viscous that solution will be. Does anyone know where that carmelan is used in the food industry? So it doesn't enhance viscosity significantly. It's used mainly as a colorant. So if anyone drinks Coke, Diet Coke, Pepsi, that colorant is carmelan. So it's a byproduct of caramelization reaction. If you let the reaction continue and become a longer chain length, it begins to significantly affect the viscosity of the continuous phase. So in this case, we typically use it in things like caramel. So you can already see, so right now we're just about at a jam consistency, but you can already start to see the change in color. You'll see viscosity still really low. I should have got a spoon without, handle, without holes. But it gives you a point. You can see it just dripping through, right? So we'll continue to let it go. So right now, we're just driving off that excess water. Once we get the rate limiting step being the, the evaporation of water, we'll start to see the reaction progress. So right now, we're not seeing caramelization actually progressing. Why? Because there's too much water present. So by boiling that water off, maybe I'll go a little bit hotter. By boiling that water off, eventually we're going to create a saturated solution meaning we can't get any more sugar in there. And at that point, we're going to start to see the boiling point elevate. Why is that? Because as we remove water from that, the concentration of sugars go up. As the concentration of sugars go up, the colligative properties go up, the boiling point goes up. Raoult's law. So we will be able to see the boiling point elevation go up by about 100 degrees Celsius through the course of this lecture. And we'll keep checking in on this as time goes by. So again, when we talk about boiling point elevation, this is extremely important in the confectionery industry because this is how you monitor the rate or the, the, the degree of completion of your caramelization reaction. So it's not like we measure the amount of sucrose to determine when this reaction is done. We can do that or we can infer that by simply looking at the boiling point and by knowing the boiling point, knowing what sugar is property, what what the property of the sugar is, we can understand very well what the concentration of sugar is. So if you look at a candy thermometer, so it should change in a second on that screen. Any second, there we go. So what you'll see on here are actually different types of candy. So you'll see a jam, this isn't going to follow with the screen, sorry. You're going to see a soft ball. You're going to see a hard, sh a hard ball, so like a, that's kind of like the soft Werther's that's going around. You're going to see a soft crack, <laughs> a hard crack, which is going to be like a shatter or something like a brittle. Then you're going to go up to caramel and then a deep fry. The deep fry is almost like a burnt sugar. It, it almost becomes black. And depending on the application in the confectionery industry, you use a candy thermometer to identify when that reaction is done and when that is suitable to go on to the next step.
So again, when we look at candy thermometers, we use the temperature, and by knowing the colligative properties of that sugar, we know the concentration. And if we know the concentration of the sugar to water, we know when our reaction's done, which we'll see in a couple minutes. So this leads us really nicely into texture. So when we talk about texture, it has a lot of important properties. The first being, again, which we've talked about time and time again, being the colligative properties in water activity. The ability of sugar to bind water, again, drastically limits the reactions that can take place, as well as whether or not that food is going to support microbial growth. So when we talk about the textural properties caused by sugar, we have to remember we're really talking about the colligative properties of that sugar itself. Does that make sense? Okay. So the first thing we talked about is freezing point depression. This is very important when we talk about frozen desserts, ice cream, sherbets, frozen yogurts, frozen foods as well. When we begin to freeze that sugar solution, we begin to freeze out ice crystals. By freezing out the ice crystals, we increase the concentration of the sugars in the unfrozen phase. By increasing the sugars, if you can get them to a high enough concentration, we begin to modify the viscosity of that unfrozen phase. Why would you want, if you can imagine in a frozen food system, you have your ice crystal, which is a terrible drawing. You have this unfrozen phase. This unfrozen phase is concentrated in protein that you've added from the milk any carbohydrates or polysaccharides you've added, as well as sugar. And you have a second ice crystal in close, close proximity. Now, when that ice cream goes through the supply chain, so you freeze it, you put it in your minus 40 freezer at the processing facility, a truck comes, you take your ice cream out, you put it on the loading dock, load it into the truck, it drives to the supermarket, it goes to the loading dock into a storage at the back, it then gets transferred into the cabinet and then you get indecisive customers that stand there with the cabinet door open and then the temperature is constantly fluctuating, right? Now, when that temperature is constantly fluctuating, what's going to happen to those ice crystals? So as the temperature rises, the ice crystals are going to begin to melt. So this becomes unfrozen. This stays frozen ice. Now, if there's nothing there, if that, if that intermediate phase or that unfrozen phase has nothing there and it's very low in viscosity, this water can migrate through the solution. Why is that problematic? When you take that tub of ice cream from your house, from the grocery store, put it in your shopping cart, finish grocery shopping, your ice is melting, it's becoming water, it's diffusing through, and then you go home and you put it back in your freezer, this ice is going to grow preferentially on larger crystals. So now you put it in your home freezer, this ice crystal grows, this ice crystal shrinks. Now you have your five-year-old son who wants ice cream, he goes in, pulls it out of the counter, waits 15 minutes, we get more ice thawing, more water diffusing, the bigger ice crystals grow, the smaller ice crystals shrink. This is a phenomenon called Oswald's ripening. Now, Oswald's ripening leads to freezer burn. It also leads to detrimental effects when you talk about preserving peas or broccoli or meat in your freezer. So every time you open that freezer and have a temperature fluctuation, the small ice crystals shrink and the large ice crystals grow in response. Why is that detrimental in the case of whole foods? Because as those ice crystals grow, they begin to run into surfaces, things like cell walls or organelle walls, and they break and rupture those walls, leading to two different phenomena. The first being drip loss, Right? So when you take your frozen meat out of the freezer and let it thaw on the counter, you notice that styrofoam pack that has that meat, that um, exudate absorbent pad, is saturated with liquid. 
The other thing it does is when it ruptures cell walls, reactants that were not in close proximity now become in close proximity because we've broken the physical barrier that separates them. Think about a banana. You take a banana, throw it in the freezer, what happens to it? It goes brown extremely fast. Why? Ice crystals are disrupting cellular structures and that polyphenol oxidase is able to come into contact with the reactants and it'll undergo browning reactions. This is not, this is, this is not isolated to just bananas. All, all foods that undergo decompartmentalization will undergo preferential reactions based on substrates now being able to come in close proximity. So it's very, very important when we talk about frozen foods to consider the thermal history of that food. So in the case of ice cream, one thing that's done is locust bean gum is added to most ice creams. And the reason for that, and we don't know why it does this, but locust bean gum has the ability to form this viscoelastic layer around an ice crystal. So when that ice thaws, it's so viscous that that water can't diffuse through that LBG layer, and when it freezes again, that water hasn't migrated to the larger crystal, but has stayed in close proximity to its original crystal and will recrystallize onto it. So adding things like locust bean gum slows down the rate in which Oswald's ripening happens, which slows down the rate of crystal growth when we're storing that frozen food product. So ice and sugar play a really important role. Similarly, boiling point elevation from the confectionery industry is extremely important. Any food that relies on, or any confection that relies on sugar, typically has the boiling point elevation being monitored. So what are we at right now? So now we're just saturated. So we've saturated our system and now we're coming up. We're boiling off excess water and you can already start to see a really slight yellow color starting to form. This is the early reaction. This is the beginning of HMF being formed. HMF is beginning to polymerize and we're starting to get a faint yellow color. Having said that, you'll notice, again, that there's no real viscosity enhancement yet. If you're sitting here, close to the front, you can probably start to smell it a little bit. So again, this is the beginning of those breakdown products that are associated with the hydrolysis and the breakdown of those sugars. Now we talked about this briefly, but also when we talk about sugars and any polysaccharides in water, they have the ability to form a glass. Now last day I got a couple questions, so I'm going to kind of talk about glasses in a little bit more detail. But to do that, we're going to talk about solids first. So when you talk about a traditional solid, it doesn't matter what it is, it typically has a crystalline structure. So think about cocoa butter. Think about sugar crystals. Think about salt crystals. They are opaque because the pattern of those molecules diffract light. If they diffract light, they become opaque. So all crystalline, or most crystalline materials, become opaque in foods. Now, the difference between a solid and a glass is in that glass, we don't get that crystalline structure, meaning those molecules are not ordered. So if we talk about a sodium chloride crystal, or a sugar crystal, or whatever, we have sodium, we have chloride, we have chloride, we have sodium, we have sodium, chloride, chloride, sodium, I hate drawing three-dimensional structures, sodium. So we get this very regular crystal lattice. So you can almost think of it as this auditorium, and each one of you is a sugar molecule, and you're all highly ordered. If, if it was full, everyone would be almost the same distance apart, and would be the same angle between that per next person. That is a crystalline structure. Now, an amorphous structure, these molecules that we talk about can't move or can't diffuse through that solution and adapt a crystalline regular periodic structure. It's too viscous. There are so many kinetic impediments that prevent that sugar from forming that crystalline structure. So you can imagine a glass 
as an extremely, extremely viscous liquid. So on a molecular level, it has the exact same structure as water. So those water molecules are somewhat randomly dispersed. Same here. The sugar water molecules are randomly dispersed. The viscosity gets so high that those molecules can no longer move. So it's a kinetically hindered state, meaning it's not in thermodynamic equilibrium, they say. It'll eventually transition to a solid, but it'll take millions and millions of years because, again, that viscosity is so high that those molecules can barely vibrate or rotate anymore, let alone, uh, let alone undergo translocation around that solution. This plays a really important role in bitter, sorry, brittle solids, things like pasta, eggshells, um, crackers. What else is really brittle? Can anyone think hard candies? Now, when we undergo the glass transition, any addition of lower molecular weight compounds will be a plasticizer, will make that solution or that system be less viscous. So in the case of a sugar glass, what molecule in the food industry do we add that's smaller than sugar? We drink it all the time, it's always in our foods. Water, right? Water plasticizes a sugar glass. So you dilute that sugar, the viscosity goes down. So plasticizers decrease the viscosity. If we have a carbohydrate glass, so something like pasta, if we add sugar to that, it's a lower molecular weight, so what was a glass forming compound in one system becomes a plasticizer in another system. So as long as the molecular weight is smaller than the glass forming, it's going to reduce the glass transition temperature. Now, in the food industry, this is horribly problematic. So, in the case of dipping dots, if you don't hold it at a cold enough temperature, they just stick together and they become a, a, an agglomerated mess. They lose that characteristic. Now, dipping dots is a relatively isolated example and doesn't have many detrimental effects to the food industry. Where it becomes really problematic is free-flowing powders. Things like lactose or your whey protein supplement, your co instant coffee, your starch powders that are in the food industry. And what happens with those is they're all extremely hygroscopic. What does that mean? What, if something is hygroscopic, what does that mean? Right. Because it's so dry, it actually pulls in the moisture from the atmosphere and begins to dilute whatever that is. And when you come out of the glass transition, it's glass transitions, again, they're characterized that they're not sticky. So if you have a powder and it's in the glass transition and you pour it out, it's going to flow really well. Take your skim milk powder, your protein powder that you're at your gym, put a little bit of water in it, seal it up and leave it for a few days and see what happens. It's going to begin to clump. That clumping is extremely problematic when you're talking about formulating a food product. Like if you're adding kilos and kilos into a vat and you have a lot of clumping, you have to overcome that and it becomes problematic. If you take your instant coffee and you let a little bit of moisture get in the, into that, it actually impedes the rehydration of that coffee, that instant coffee. So you can get clumps in that. So it's really, really important when you talk about glasses that you preserve the amount of moisture in it. You don't want to allow that environment's moisture to diffuse into that product because when it does, it begins to soften. So again, you can think of that cracker. Take a couple drops, take a premium plus cracker tonight, put a few drops of water on it, and look at how quickly that structure goes from that nice brittle, that breaking structure, to that kind of bread-like mealy structure. You also see it in the candies that you're passing around. So you can see you have a glass in the one, and in the other, you have a very soft, chewy caramel. This is dependent partially on the amount of water that's present, but also if you look, They've changed the amount of glucose and sucrose. 
because outside of the scope of this course because different sugars have the ability or the tendency to form different structures either a glass a crystal or as a solution state what temperature are we at okay so we're almost at a jam again you can see we're starting to see a little bit more yellow color but again we're not really seeing any enhancement in viscosity so the boiling point now I pulled it out. It was, a, it was close to 104. So about 104. So we'll keep watching it as it goes. Now when we talk about cane sugars, cane sugars are important, but they are very, very expensive. So one of the things that the food industry has done has looked at making alternatives to cane sugar. And the two ways we do this is either through is either through the formation of maltodextrins or high fructose corn syrup. So, if you take a starch, just like the human body does, it re we release amylase and we begin to break that starch down into what with amylase. We add amylase to starch. What's our main uh, product? Maltose. Is maltose very sweet? No. So maltose isn't a good sweetener. So what we do is we take amylose and we treat our cornstarch with amylose and we break it down into mal maltodextrin. We then add a second enzyme and that second enzyme is what we call sacrophination. And that breaks down the maltose into its monosaccharides, which is maltose is made up of glucose. Now, what molecule, what sugar, is more sweet than glucose? Fructose. So, maltodextrins, or dextrose-based sugars, have two steps of the reaction. They undergo a treatment with amylase, and then the sacrification, ugh, sacrification step, which gets us two glucose molecules. But we want to increase the sweetness. We want to be able to take that commodity, use less sugar to make it equally as sweet, right? Reduce the cost. How do we do that? We use a glucose isomerase to convert glucose into fructose. So we can change the sweetness by tailoring the reactivity of sugars. Remember, the sweetness of the sugar is dependent on that three-dimensional chemical structure. So it's going to pretend, it's going to depend on if it's a hexose sugar or a five-membered, a pentose sugar, so an aldose versus a ketose sugar. It's also going to depend on what the chirality of that sugar is. Is it something like glucose or is it something like lactose? That's not a good example. <laughs> Anyhow, so when we talk about sugar manufacturing in North America, we don't rely heavily on cane sugars. They're too expensive. In the processed food industry, it's all about cost reduction. So typically, we use our maltodextrins, and as we progress with this reaction, we increase the sweetness and we decrease the viscosity. So we can create all kinds of dis different dextrose equivalents. So basically what it's saying is, if you create a gram of this compound, it's going to taste as sweet as X amount of dextrose or glucose. The more we hydrolyze that starch, the sweeter it's going to be, right? So the more we chop it up and the more we make it into maltose, the sweeter that that sugar is going to be. And depending on the application of that product, we change the dextrose equivalent. So if we go between 35 and 55, this is typically a normal conversion. If we want to go below 20% dextrose equivalent, it's not very sweet. It's more of a viscosity enhancer. So we can develop different ingredients based on corn starch, and depending on how long we let that reaction go for, we'll change the functional properties of that starch. So we have all of our different starches, our hydrolates, will have a dextrose equivalent to report on. This is to give you an idea of how sweet it's going to be and how much it's going to modify the viscosity.
Now, if we want to create a really sweet product, something that we don't have to use a lot of to create that same sweetness, we use high fructose corn syrup. So we convert a portion of that glucose using glucose isomerase to form fructose. Remember, fructose is sweeter than, than glucose, so we get an enhanced sweetness in that product. So high fructose corn syrups are excellent at providing sweetness, but they're also really, really good at binding water. So high fructose corn syrups are used in a whole gamut of processed foods. Again, because we can tailor the functional properties of that product, as well as corn is extremely inexpensive comparatively to cane sugar. So if I want to create a box of cookies and I want my price point to be $1, I'm not going to put expensive ingredients into it, right? I'm going to find the cheapest garbage that I can find that's going to give me the desired outcome. So we use maltodextrins and we use high fructose corn syrup. So when we talk about sugar and we talk about the negative health attributes of sugar, we have to take into consideration the physical properties that they impart because simply adding a sweetener doesn't impart color, doesn't impart texture. Now, we're going to take a bit of an aside here as this happens. What are we at now? We are at a jam, so we're going up. Okay. So this is going to seem like a really weird tangent, but we're going to come back in a second. So Dr. Anand is a University of Guelph professor, and she did a really interesting study recently and just published it. And what she was trying to show was in North America, we are, very, we are a very rare population in that if I were to ask you what your staple food is, I bet none of you can identify what, a, what your staple food is, right? We all have a fairly diverse diet. We follow the Canadian food guide, right? So we have servings of vegetables, we have eggs, we have meat, we have different grains, we have different fruits. This is not a global reality. This is an extreme privilege to be able to have a food supply and to be able to afford foods that we can actually diversify and eat what is in accordance to the Canadian food guide. If, if we accepted the fact that all food access should be equal right and that everyone globally is going to have the same access to the, the foods we have, how many times do you think we would have to grow? How, how much do you think our food land use would grow? Where was that fact? Sorry, I need to find it. There we go. So we would have to increase the amount of agricultural land the size of Canada to give the world access to the same foods that we have. So it's not a global reality. So when we talk about staple foods, the vast majority of the populations in Asia, in Africa, rely on most of their calories from a single nutrient source. So they'll eat a diet high in rice, wheat, maize, corn, meat, whatever it may be. Corn is a really interesting one. Why? Well, partly because corn feeds the food industry so many different ingredients for processed foods. Think about it, cornstarch, corn flour, high fructose corn syrup, maltodextrins. When we talk about corn, it's very, very important from a food security perspective. What's challenging about it and what's actually starting to happen, which is a little bit scary, is the ownership of agricultural land that's arable enough to produce good quality crops is not only diminishing, right, because of global warming, but it's also being bought up by specific countries. So they control the majority of the food supply. So if you rely heavily on importation of foods, you rely very much on free trade. So when the US changes trade barriers, 
it really has a huge effect on what happens with our commodities. So if we don't have open and free markets and we have an overproduction of a crop or a commodity such as corn, what do we do with it? So this statistic absolutely shocked me. So in Canada, 5,000, ooh, man, I, my voice cracks a lot. 5,000 farms is sufficient to produce all the sweet corn we need for our consumption. So this is corn on the cob, this is frozen corn, this is um, frozen corn and canned corn. 5,000 farms in Canada produce all the niblets we need. The other 50 some odd thousand farms producing corn specifically produce it for either, for either as a feed, as grain, as a silage, or as a corn for grain, making starches and protein powders. So when we talk about the corn industry, again, you have to get out of that idea that when we talk about corn, potatoes, it's not usually sold to the consumer. It's sold as ingredients which go into processed foods which are then bought. I put a video in here, I'm not going to play it today. It is an excellent video on how to identify if a corn is being grown as a niblet or for grain, or if it's being grown for silage, i.e. the stock as a cattle feed. Why aren't you going? I may have to do this one by hand because it has a video. There we go. So when we talk about corn, if we look again at the maize kernel, we get some that goes for storage, we sold, sell whole kernel products, we do dry milling, so we make flour, we make breakfast cereals, we make animal feed, we make liquor from corn, we make starch, we make sweeteners, we make oil, we make to tostito chips, we make tortillas, we make massa flour. Corn and a lot of the agricultural commodities are converted into products which are then go into processed foods. So again, for all those people who are anti-processed -process foods, what would the other 55,000 farms in Canada manufacture if they didn't, all of a sudden, if we started to outlaw or started to have this social revolt against processed foods? The challenge in doing that is niblets and corn is very difficult to preserve, right? Take corn on the cob, leave it at home, it's good for two weeks. In Canada, harvest is all within a month. From one province to the next, our corn comes out of the field September, October. So in September and October and November, we're going to have 60, 70,000 farms manufacturing, harvesting corn. We're going to eat about 5,000 farms worth. The rest is going to rot if we don't make it into shelf-stable products like flour, like starch, like oil, like protein. So a cob of corn will last a few weeks. But if we extract its oil and put it in a good container, it's, don't expose it to light, it's going to last for a year. Flowers and starches can last for many years. So when you start talking about getting rid of all processed foods, think about the consequences that would have on not only food security, but also on a farmer's livelihood. So all of a sudden, 55,000 farmers are harvesting their corn and they're trying to sell it all to you, the consumers. That's going to drive the price of corn way down. And this is why the new NAFTA agreement is so problematic, right? Anyone know what the new NAFTA agreement does to dairy farmers? What's that? 3.95%. More U.S. dairy can come in to, the, to Canada. What does that mean? That's going to drive our prices down. So you can be a conscientious consumer and only buy Canadian made milk, which a lot of us will do. But when you go to McDonald's and that cheese slice is on that hamburger, you don't know where they got the milk to make that cheese slice. They don't label that, label that as made in Canada milk. Or when you go and buy your McCain's frozen pizza, you don't know if that cheese is made in Canada or the US. So when you start to think about the economy and our, the way we, subs it's not subsidizing, that's not the right word, the way we control our milk prices is by controlling and restricting the amount of production. In the US, they don't. So a farmer can produce as much milk as he wants, even if there's no demand for it. And now what are they going to do? They're going to dump it on us. So it's going to affect our dairy industry. Now, when we talk about 
the realistic nature of our food supply, again, when we talk about GMOs, they play a huge role in increasing the amount of food that we can produce. I think anyone, irrespective of the degree of education, will understand that the amount of land we have to grow food is limited, right? The amount of agricultural land that exists in the world is limited. It's limited based on temperature and weather, water supply, and encroachment in urbanization. So, as we continue to grow our population, we need more food, we have less land to grow it on, that land is less arable in time as we grow more and more field crops on it, yet our crop density continues year over year to increase. The reason it's increasing is because of scientific technologies that have been developed. Things like herbicides, pesticides, GMOs. If we go to organic farming, it comes at a tremendous cost, right? In organic farming, your crop density drops. You have more loss to pests, right? If you're not putting a pesticide on your crop, are we ready for the next one? All right, so what are we at now? Uh, like one so we're at a softball now. So if we were to cool this down, so now you can start to see a difference in the viscosity. So now if I start to cool this down, this is going to form something like that soft caramel you have. Not quite that hard of a texture, but you can see that we've eliminated enough water, that that sugar is becoming so concentrated that the viscosity is going up. We're getting the polymerization of HMF, so we're getting a little bit more color. It's a little bit hard to see because of the bubbles. Maybe I'll just pull it off there for a second. <laughs> No, it's, you yeah. can kind of see it. So we'll continue to let it go. Mm -hmm. We might actually run out of water for that, um, that thermometer. So these intensive processes are extremely important at increasing yield. Again, we have a limited amount of agricultural space that we can grow commodities on. So we need to maximize the output of that land. Things like GMOs are what do that. And you guys are too young to realize the consequences of when agriculture is not protected by technology. So, this is the, probably the most famous example, which is the Great Famine. Everyone's heard of the potato famine, right? In Ireland, that happened in the 1800s. What I don't think people realize is there is a greater Irish population outside of Ireland than there is an inside Ireland because of this. This created such a famine that people left the United States in droves. Where did most of them end up? Anyone know? You said they left the United States. Left Sorry, Ireland. Going to, going to yeah. United States. <laughs> half, of the US, half of the Irish population was affected. 20% of the population left and about a million people died from the famine. Now, things like GMOs can protect against different outbreaks, different bacteria. So in the case of the Irish potato, or the Irish lumper, which was the cultivar that was susceptible, again, just like when we talk about the banana, it's a mono, it's a mono culture, meaning all of the potato plants are identically the same, so there's no genetic variation. So when there was a population of, I think it was mold, it ended up wiping those potatoes out. What's scary about that is this mold is making a resurgence. And it has the ability, or it could reach, epidemic proportions where it eliminates potatoes. Again, not necessarily a huge deal for us because we don't rely solely on potatoes as our main calorie source, but there are areas of the world that rely primarily on potatoes for an energy source. So what if we genetically modify potatoes to be resistant to that, bacteria, that mold? It's already been done. We already know how to do that. We can create a product which is resistant. Not only that, if you use GMOs and you can increase the yield by 15%, you can pull 15 to 20 percent of the farmers out of food insecurity by increasing the yield of cotton they produce. So GMOs not only have the ability to protect our food supply, but have a huge impact 
on food security. And I tried so hard to get this white russet. Right now, it's available in the market on the US. It's not available in Canada, and they wouldn't ship it over the border. But it's a very, very cool GMO potato. The first thing that's cool about it, okay, the first thing that's cool about the GMO potato is that it's resistant to that outbreak that eliminated, that wiped out potatoes in Ireland. The other thing that's really cool about it is when you peel potatoes, if you're at home making mashed potatoes and you're peeling potatoes, what do you have to do to them? You have to put them in water. On an industrial scale, this is problematic. So if you're ma working at a potato factory making french fries, when you cut that french fry, you immediately have to go into the next processing unit operation. If it's freezing, if it's adding sulfates, whatever it is, you've got to immediately move from the cutting process to the next one because once you've cut it and exposed it to oxygen, it's going to undergo browning reactions. They've eliminated that in the white russet. So you can cut a white russet potato, leave it on the counter, and it's not going to go brown. This again has implications in food security because if those potatoes are peeled and go brown, they end up getting disposed of or going to pig feed. So it's important that we're able to limit that reaction. What are we at now? Uh, we just passed our ball. All we're right. Almost at salt. Salt. We're almost at a soft crack. So here we go. So now you can see the viscosity is really getting enhanced. If you're sitting near the front, you can really start to smell it. But now it's getting really, really viscous to stir. So it's getting really thick. Talked about that. So again, we can genetically modify, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Pota we can genetically modify foods so we get desirable physical properties. Things like, oh, that white russet potato is also a low acrylamide producer. So you can fry with it now and it's going to produce less acrylamide. So it's healthier, less resistant to disease, and doesn't brown. All right. So that's our monosaccharides. Let's move on to oleosaccharides. So oleosaccharides are these between 3 and 10 carbohydrates. They don't have a sweet perception, so they're typically not used as flavoring, and they're not long enough to change viscosity. So these don't have a lot of applications in the food industry right now. Really where oleosaccharides are really interesting are as prebiotics. So as a fermentation source for the healthy gut microflora. So that's really where these are getting a lot of their interest. And there's they're naturally found in a lot of vegetables, things like onions, garlic, shellfish, so chitosan. So we've got the fructo-oleosaccharides, are things like inulin, comprised mainly of fructose. We've got the, galacto, the galactosaccharides, which are produced from things like whey protein. Don't worry about which ones are produced. Oleosaccharides typically are used as prebiotics and other beneficial health properties. There's not a lot we can talk about with them because again, they don't really impart physical properties. But one thing I want to point out, and this is true also for polysaccharides, is that when we talked about that naming, so that 4-ortho-alpha-D-galactopyranosyl-D-glucose, it tells us how those sugar molecules come together. Why is that important? Because the physical properties of proteins are dependent on the structures that the polysaccharides form. So if you have a highly branched polysaccharide, amylopectin, it has very different starch pasting properties than amylose. So if you're going to make a soup that's a very thick soup using starch as a thickening agent, it matters if it's branched or if it's linear. So it matters if it's in the alpha 1,4 or alpha 1,6, or if it's a beta 1,4, or a beta 1,6, or a 1,3, or a 1,2, doesn't matter. It's important that we're able to recognize that the way those monosaccharides and disaccharides are put together influence the supramolecular structure of polysaccharides, and then that modifies the physical properties or the functionality of those polysaccharides. So if we're going to use them to thicken, or if we want them to be resistant to staling, the physical properties are depending on that. So when we talk about oleosaccharides, they're not sweet, so they don't provide flavor. They don't really play a role in color. They don't play a role in Maillard reaction. They have a little bit of a role in water activity. It's not significant. 
They will freeze concentrate, but it's minor. And they do form glasses. Really, the only application, or the only interest in the food, I shouldn't say the only interest, the big interest in the food industry is using these as prebiotics or as energy sources to grow specific bacteria. Now, we go above 10, 10 polysaccharides, 10 carbohydrates, and we get polysaccharides. Now, polysaccharides differ based on their conformation, which sugars they contain. So you can have a polysaccharide with just one sugar repeating over and over and over. Amylose is a good example of this, right? So it's glucose, 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 glucose. That's what we call a homopolysaccharide. All of the sugars within that polysaccharide are the same. Heteropolysaccharides have different sugars that make up their polysaccharides. So glucosamines. We have neutral polysaccharides that carry no charge and we have charged polysaccharides that carry a charge, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, we're at a caramel now. So now you can see the color has drastically changed. So now we've got our conversion of HMF is beginning to rapidly polymerize. That polymerization is leading to a brown color. What else do we notice? Viscosity is still going up. If we were to let this cool, this would go to a very hard solid, right? So I think we can stop it here. I think it's illustrated the point, so we can let that cool down. Yeah. So, depending on the structure of the polysaccharide determines what it's good to be used for. And we're going to talk about a few different ones. The first one we're going to talk about is amylose. We've already talked about it a little bit, but amylose is a very, very important polysaccharide because it's used to structure so many different foods and is contained in so many different foods. So if we look at, let's say, amylopectin. So that molecule at the top could be some kind of amylopectin. So if we take our glucose molecule and we begin to polymerize it, so we're down here at this end, do we have a hemiacetyl group here? No. How about here? No. Here? No. Here? No. What about here? Yes. So all amylopectins have one reducing end. It'll branch off into many, many different branches, but all the branched ends are non-reducing sugars. So, if we have amylose, it can undergo Maillard reaction, but it's insignificant because for one mole of poly polysaccharide, we only have one reaction point, which is trivial. So, it's not going to undergo significant browning. But, the branching determines how it's going to structure that liquid. So we have all different degrees of polymerization. So the, the chain length varies. The degree of branching varies. The presence of sugar varies. And whether or not it's hetero or homopolysaccharide means there's either one or multiple different sugars present. And again, the most famous polysaccharide... Oh. Let's put that there. That's probably the burnt one now that we've got to. <laughs> if it's not at the top, it is at the bottom. You can smell it, right? You can smell that kind of... It's not burnt. Oh, it's overflowing. Mm. Well, that's unfortunate mess. Hmm. At least I'm not in here next. Oh, what a mess. That's all going in the garbage after you guys leave. Anyone need a pot? Just take that out because I want that. All right, where did it go? All right. You know what? This is a really good place to stop. We'll talk about the physical properties of polysaccharides next week as I deal with this mess I've